Okay, time is 11 o'clock, so let's begin. Uh, the midterm is in one week. Uh, we will spend some time during our next class reviewing for the midterm. Please bring questions if you have them uh, to class next time regarding the midterm. Uh, assignment number three is due Friday at noon. We will discuss this assignment more shortly. Our, and, we, and today we will hopefully finish up the bootstrap section finally. Um, we're just going to talk about regression, regression models and bootstrap. Um, are there any questions before we get started here? Yes. Um, about the project presentation, um, will we need to, if we need to have people download software, will we need to plan ahead to have the students do that before we present? They don't necessarily have to do it before you present, uh, just but they... they need it for the homework. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, when we have to do homework assignments, the three out of the seven, I'm assuming that we don't do our own? That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only question that came And of course, you should share your answer yeah. key with the other students in <laughs> class. Other questions? Okay, so we got this uh, second set of bootstrap notes to talk about here. Um, so we're going to talk about regression models. How can we use the bootstrap with respect to these regression models? So let's just briefly talk about a simple linear regression model um, under normality assumptions. You know, what you learned about in your very first stat course, just to review. Put <coughs> red pen on here. Oops. Okay, so here's our regression model. Uh, y sub j is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x sub j plus epsilon sub j. We're going to assume that the x's are constants. Uh, the epsilons are iid normal 0 sigma squared. So notice that we have an equal variance there and a mean of 0 for the epsilons. That, of course, means that y is distributed normal as well. And then uh, what I have here, and we have n observations. Uh, and so what I have here is next just some of the usual results that you would have with this kind of model. So if you're using the least squares method, you could derive beta hat 1 and beta hat 0, the corresponding estimates to beta 1 and beta 0. Uh, we're going to let the estimated mean response based upon our model be mu hat sub j. You know, oftentimes you'll see people call this y hat sub j. I just chose mu hat to be consistent with um, actually what Davis and Hinckley do in their book. Then to examine how far is our model off from our actual observation itself, we can look at residuals. They will be denoted by E sub J. That's just equal to Y sub J minus mu hat sub J. Of course, residuals from a least squares fit. Um, uh, the residuals end up summing to zero. Our mean square error, in other words, our estimate for sigma square is just the sum of these residual square divided by n minus 2. The 2 comes about through estimating two beta parameters. Under our assumptions here for our model, uh, the beta hats have normal distributions to them. Uh, they are unbiased estimators. And also they have the corresponding variances as shown there. <coughs> Now, the expected value of our residuals is zero. The variance of our residuals is not just sigma squared. It's actually sigma squared times 1 minus h sub j, where h sub j is the j diagonal element of the hat matrix. OK. Uh, this will be an important uh, aspect shortly, uh, given that the residuals are not, uh, do not have a variance of sigma squared exactly. Uh, sometimes you might want to consider looking at what are called modified residuals, where you just si simply take your regular old residual and divide by the square root of 1 minus that hat matrix diagonal value. And the reason why you might want to do that is because notice then the variance of R sub j is sigma squared, is what you're dividing by there. You could also look at standardized residuals too. So, you know, the variance of yj minus mu hat sub j is sigma hat squared times 1 minus h sub j. So I'm going to divide by the square root of that in the denominator here. Now I have standardized residuals. Okay. 
So, you know, one of the underlying assumptions then with this model is normality and also, uh, you know, uh, constant variance as well. So, you know, what happens if normality or, or the constant variance assumption do not hold? Well, then your standard inference procedures that you learned about in your very first set course may not work out. So, you know, for example, with your confidence intervals for, let's say, beta 1, you know, we might state 95%, but in fact, it might not truly be 95% in terms of the confidence level. So, uh, then into the rescue comes the bootstrap, because uh, we don't have those underlying assumptions that we have, to, or we don't necessarily have to deal with those underlying assumptions. And there are two different ways then to go about taking your resamples. One is to use a model-based resampling procedures, which is very similar to something that we did in the hypothesis testing section. Uh, and also you can use case-based resampling. So first of all, let's talk about model-based resampling. Please note the, the small error on page three. Remove the N. So if this model here is correct, and I don't need to have to worry about normality to do this resampling approach, but if the model itself is correct, I mean I have equal variances still for my epsilons, then we can take advantage of this um, in terms of how we do our resampling through this model-based resampling. And what I'm going to do here is very, very similar <coughs> to what you saw for approach number three when we did a hypothesis test for the difference of two means. So, I should have that up here. So this takes us back to page about 72 in the notes. 73. <coughs> so if you remember in this particular situation, so the I subscript on the Y denotes essentially which treatment you could say, or in other words, which group. The J corresponds to the observation within the treatment group. And what we do with this particular approach is that we assume that our data came about through this model, essentially. Mu sub I is equal to sigma I times epsilon sub I J, where epsilon sub I J's are I I D zero, uh, uh, mean zero variance of one. Under the null hypothesis, then, we replace mu sub i with just mu itself. And then we, could, we form these residuals uh, as shown there. Now, what we did with those residuals, or remember now, those residuals essentially all have exactly the same distribution to them. And, and so what we did was we took advantage of that aspect and we decided to say, okay, well, let's resample from these residuals and reform and, and, and oops, don't want to do that. Let's just do an arrow. <laughs> and just reform our model in order to find our Y stars to get our resampled Ys. So we took Again, a random sample from the E's essentially, we call them E stars, and then plugged in the estimates for the mu hat, I'm sorry, for the mu, the estimate for the sigma, and then we reformed Y, that's how we got our resampled Y's. We're essentially gonna do the same thing here for model-based resampling with a general regression model. Okay. So we could resample directly these, our residuals themselves the y sub j minus mu hat sub j. Because after all, these are estimating the epsilons. So we could do that. But there's a problem with doing that. And that is, each of these e's has a different variance due to the hat matrix diagonal values. Uh, which then is not the same as what we had with our epsilons. Because remember, our epsilons all had an equal variance, and that variance was sigma squared. So what we're going to do instead is work with these modified residuals that I showed to you a few minutes ago. Because remember, those modified residuals, after we you know, divide the residuals by those 1 minus the hat matrix diagonal values, do have a variance of sigma squared. 
So we're going to resample from those guys rather than the E's. But we're going to actually do one other little change here. Remember how the E's had a mean of zero? Yeah, that's just a byproduct of doing least squares estimation. Well, that was nice to have a mean of zero because after all, the epsilons had a mean of zero. These R's here, if I were to take the sample mean of them, it's not necessarily equal to zero. It's going to be very close, but not necessarily equal to zero exactly. So instead of sampling the R's themselves, we're going to actually resample mean adjusted R's. Now that does screw up a little bit the variance, because now the variance of this R sub J minus R bar is no longer sigma squared. So I was like, ah, oh, shoot. Fix one problem, create another problem. Well, this particular problem is not that difficult, because you could show, and you could take a look at, if you want a more in-depth explanation, you can show that indeed that th this variance here is close to sigma squared. And as n gets big, it's basically this, you can say a remainder term here, goes to zero. So that's why we can still work with these mean adjusted modified residuals. So again, all this explanation here is to get to a point where we can say we are going to resample our mean adjusted modified residuals. So let's resample. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take our mu hats of j from just our regular data itself. So just with your regular data, your observed data, find beta hat 0, find beta hat 1, keep your original observed x's, form your mu hat. So in other words, all your estimated values, put them there, then your epsilon j star is going to be resampled from these mean adjusted modified residuals. So just resample them, put them in that model, and then form again a yj star. That's how you get your resampled y's. Hopefully you think this is somewhat intuitive, where essentially, you know, if you were to ever, let's say, simulate data from a regression model, what would you start off with? Well, define the distribution of epsilon, simulate some epsilons, put those epsilons into your model with your true value of beta zero, your true value of beta one, whatever you chose your x's to be, and out comes out your y's. And essentially that's what we're doing here. Any questions? Now one aspect of doing this model-based resampling procedure that's good is that notice your x's here are going to be exactly the same as what was in your original data itself because that's how we're forming our mu hats. Take your x's from your original data, your beta hats from your original data, essentially, that are estimated, and get your y's. So you could say then, since we often call the, the x's as part of the design matrix, your data here for every single resample is going to have exactly the same design. It's going to be important later on. So let's take a look at how we can actually do this. Uh, this is an example uh, out of Davidson Hinckley's book regarding uh, various mammals and their body size and their brain size as well. So for example, an African elephant uh, has an average body weight of 6,654 kilograms and a brain size of 5,712 grams. In other words, right there. And we're just simply looking at the relationship between body size and brain size. You can download the data set from my, um, uh, from my course website. So I'm going to do a plot here. I'm going to actually do the scaling of the data. I'm going to work with the natural log transformation. And this is what we get for our data. So the natural log of body weight on the x-axis, the natural log of brain weight is on the y-axis. And what we like to do is use body weight to predict brain weight. What do you think? Do we have a nice kind of linear relationship? Yes, we do. So that's kind of cool. 
So that means linear regression is probably going to work out well for us. So how do we estimate the model then? Well, we use the LM function. Uh, normally I would do, put this here. I don't know why I didn't there. Formula equal. Just to emphasize what the um, uh, argument name is. Formula equal uh, the log of brain tilde the log of body. Data is in mammals. Put the results in an object called mod.fit. I'm fitting a model, for lack of a better name. And if I summarize it, this is what I get. So here's my beta hat 0. And here's my beta hat 1. Here's the square root of the estimated variance of beta hat 1. And then we have a nice little two test here uh, that tests the significance of beta 1. And we can see the p-value is quite small, so it says that there is sufficient evidence to indicate a linear relationship between the log of body and the log of brain. R squared is 0.92, so that's good. Um, we could also take a look at all the components that are inside in mod.fit if you wanted to see them, in case you've never used the LM function before. Uh, also, if I use then the ANOVA function with mod.fit, we get the usual old ANOVA table that you get, for example, on the first page of the PROC reg output. Okay. Let's see here. So page 2.7 does give the actual stated model itself. Um, I mean, just taking the beta hat 0 and beta hat 1 from the, uh, from the output. Okay, so let's find these modified residuals and then the mean adjusted modified residuals so that we can do some resampling. So the first thing I need to do is find these hat matrix diagonal values. So if you haven't used R before to do something like this, there's actually a nice little function R called lm.influence. So linear model influence. And you know, if you take in a course like STAT 870, there's a variety of influence measures out there. So this lm.influence calculates a whole bunch of them. And I'm going to put that into an object called influence.stat. And we are only interested in the hat matrix diagonal value, so I'm going to pull out the hat component and put that into h.j. To form the modified residuals then, I pull out the residuals component of mod.fit and divide by the square root of 1 minus h dot j. That goes into r dot j. Notice also I calculate r bar. In other words, the mean of the r's, I get negative 0.0008. Notice it's not exactly equal to 0, as I mentioned before. So that's why we do this little mean adjustment. Typically, in most situations, uh, it's always going to be something quite close to 0. And lastly here, if I put the results from summary mod mod.fit into an object called sum.fit you're going to and then do a names with it you're going to notice a comp particular component called sigma this gives me my square root of my MSE which will be important later so square root of MSE is 0.69 you can also look at a various diagnostics too don't worry about this uh, you know with your model um, you know, Davis and Hinckley in their book says, yeah, there might be some non-constant variance issues. Eh, perhaps. It should be necessary to pick it. Okay, now finally we'll get to the resampling aspect. <coughs> okay. We'll go over here to 10. I want to make sure that I have the right model available to me. Nope, I do not. Just a second here. I was going through my lecture for my other class before for this class. And I had written over my mod.fit. Okay. So of course I'm going to set a seed. Uh, and then I'm going to create an object called boot.res.mod based. So I use the boot function as, as we've always done. And then for my data. I take my RJs that I formed, subtract off the mean of the RJs. So that's what I'm actually resampling from. 
my function that calculates my statistic is going to be called calc.t.modbase that we'll look at very shortly. I'm going to do 4,999 resamples. Sim equal ordinary. Just simply resampling like usual. And we're also going to pass in two other uh, bits of information. And first of all, all my mu hats. So those could be extracted from the mod.fit object uh, by looking at the fitted.values component of it. And also I'm going to pass in my x values. So in other words, the log of the mammals, uh, uh, the, body, the, the body weight. Okay. So if I come up here, here's my calc.t.modbase. Function, as always, data i. And then here are my other bits of information I need to pass in. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create an object called epsilon. These are going to be my epsilon stars. So I'm going to pull them out of the, res of the, of the original data. Or I'm sorry, uh, and pull them out of the mean adjusted modified residuals that have been resampled. And then I'm going to reform my y. So this is going to be my y star. Notice I'm going to use the mu hat that we had previously, right there, and I just add to it my epsilon stars. Next, I fit my model to my resampled data. So I use the LM function once again, formula equal, here are my Y stars, tilde, my original X's. And that's why I passed in my original X's. Notice since I am using log transformation here, that was already trans. Uh, the, the transformation was already done based upon what I passed in. Then I'm going to also summarize the model fit, put that into object. And then lastly, when I'm going to return back my beta hats and also my square root of my MSE. Any questions? Okay, so let's try this out without using the boot function. So I just use my calc.t.mod base, similar to what I've always done when I tried this kind of stuff out. Here are my mean adjusted modified residuals. I'm going to use observations 1 through n. And this is what I get. Okay, so these beta hats, here's beta hat 0 and beta hat 1 that I got. They are not exactly the same as what was observed or what, what we got with the original data itself. Why is that? You have to really look at the decimal places there to see that, in fact, they are not exactly the same. But I think this is important to point out, so that's why I want to. Why aren't they the same as what I got originally when I used the LM function? Well, it's not just that. It's, it's the fact that you know, I'm using these modified residuals, and whether or not they're mean adjusted or not, uh, these beta hats are not going to be the same as what was, uh, uh, what was got with my original data. What would you actually put in here for the data argument if you wanted to get exactly the same as what, what we got originally when we did the LM function? Your actual residuals, yeah. Because remember, you know, what is a residual? Well, it's y minus mu hat. Okay? Uh, so if you just reorder that, you can see if I take mu hat plus e, I get y. <coughs> also notice how my square root of my MSC is not exactly the same either. That's what will be expected based on what, what we talked about. Okay, so then I can do my bootstrap. And I guess we don't really need to do it here. I could just simply show you. And so this is what I get. So these original values, remember they will not match what was actually originally obtained with the data. We have estimates of bias. We have our estimated variances, or square root of variances, as we've done before. 
Here is some summaries for beta hat zero and beta hat one. So I, I plotted the, re, the values that are, were obtained from the resamples. Um, and also then I plotted uh, normal distribution approximations. But where do these normal distribution approximations come from? Just to make sure you do realize that. Come back up here. On page one of these notes, remember how the beta hats have normal distributions to them. So to get then um, the normal distribution to plot up there, all I did was, for example, um, I plotted for, um, for beta hat zero, I plotted a normal distribution with the mean of beta hat zero and a variance of sigma hat squared uh, times the rest of that stuff. So that's the normal distribution I'm plotting there, <clears throat> since we don't know what truly beta zero is or what sigma squared is. The main point, though, is that notice that, if I eventually get back, normality looks like it works very well for the sampling distribution for beta hat zero. Same thing occurs for beta hat one. So, you know, of course, in a real world, real world situation, you never know if you have normality for your epsilons. But what this little demonstration shows us is that, hey, for this data set, things work out well, even if you make the normality assumption. Now, this is also a good illustration of why neural linear regression is often said to be robust to non-normality, to some respect. Okay. Well, you know, if, if I were to do, or how should I put this? Well, how about if I, I found a studentized <coughs> statistic? You know, when is this useful? Let's say if I want to do a confidence interval for beta one and use a studentized interval. So if I wanted to do a studentized statistic here, of course I would take beta hat one star, I would take all of them, all 4,999 of them, subtract off my beta hat one, and then I need to figure out, well, what do I put in here for the square root of that estimated variance? You know, you could use the jackknife, you could use the, uh, uh, essentially a double bootstrap, but since we already have uh, an expression for the variance of beta hat one itself that one could simply derive, which you probably have all done in some setting before. How about we just simply stick that expression in there, except since I want to calculate this for every resample, I put a star there. So this is this would be calculated, this would change for every single resample. So once I do that then, calculate for every resample. How about, as in, similar to what we've done before, I use the quantile function, type equal one, find the uh, 0.05 and 0.95 quantiles of these z stars. I get negative point, I'm sorry, negative 1.71 and a positive 1.67. Now, again, normally, we would say that this has a standard normal distribution to it. That's what you would want to learn in your very first SAC course. Well, what would be those corresponding quantiles then? negative 1.65 and positive 1.65. And again, we have a, another confirmation that what the bootstrap's gonna give you should be very similar to what you will learn in your very first step course. Are there any, any questions about that? Okay. So now we have some questions, or I guess I didn't phrase them as questions, but we're gonna talk about them like questions. You know, basically, now we can apply all the stuff that you've learned in the first set of bootstrap notes now to here because we have our beta hat stars. So if I wanted to find a confidence interval for beta one, what would you do? What would be a function R that you would use? Boot yeah, boot.ci, okay? You know, you can get the percentile interval. You can get the, well, we just talk, kind of talked about the student ties interval. You can get all that stuff. So that's not difficult. 
how about a confidence interval for the expected value of y? You know, maybe you wanted to predict that x equal, we'll just be general and say x zero. What would you need to do? Done confidence intervals before. You know, what, what is a expected value of y is a linear combination of your betas, right? So what do you think you would do? So I'm sorry, say it one more time, please. Well, expected value of y is a beta zero half of beta one x squared. So if, if you replace the x inside, you're going to have an expression. So in other words, I think this is what you're getting at. For every resample, calculate that. Yes. OK. Yeah. We'll call that mu hat star. Now what? What do we do with beta hat one star, let's say, uh, if I wanted to find a confidence interval? I have mu hat stars now. Perhaps the answer is just too obvious and you just don't want to say it. What will be a function r that you can immediately go to to do this? Boot.ci. OK, there you go. That's it. You know, percentile interval, I'll just take the 0 0.025 and 0 0.975 quantiles. Of course, you should do the percentile interval, it's just easier for me to say it. <laughs> um, okay, now if you wanted to use the boot.ci function, the best way to do it is to make sure that this component that you are getting returned to you from using the boot function contains all your mu hat stars. So how do you need to do that? And back up here in your calc.t.modbase function, just put in another component that's returned that ends up being your mu hats. Does that make sense? That's the easiest way to do it. So do we just plug in the linear form and then return yeah. that? You could use, for example, the predict function to do that automatically for you. Uh, now, another way that you could do it is, remember, the main thing that you need is the beta hat stars, right? So let's say you just got the beta hat stars like what we just did here. Well, then what you could do <coughs> is simply just you know, take column one of your boot.res.mod base, take column two of your boot.res.mod base, take it times x, and then you get your 4,999 mu hat stars. The one, one problem is, is that you're not going to be able to use them boot.ci. And so you're going to have to essentially do it by hand, similar to what I had shown you in class. Okay. Now I think all of you probably have heard this. Have you heard of an uh, inverse prediction before? Just to review. I know at least when I teach step 870, I always talk about it. So here's x and here's y. And suppose that this is your estimated linear regression model there. And so it, what inverse prediction says is that let's say you know what y is. We'll call it y0. You know what y is, and you want to know, and you want to predict well, what would be the corresponding x for it? So you're, in other words, you're kind of going in the inverse direction from what you're used, used to doing. And there's your maybe x hat zero. Okay. Now let's say that I want to find a confidence interval for the true value of x given a particular y. How would you do that?
And let's say I want to use the boot.ci function. Yeah, just solve, solve it backward. Well, kind of. I, let's, let's be careful here. So let's say, uh, so my model is expected value of y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. So let's solve for x. So that would be x is equal to uh, expected value of y minus beta 1. Oops, beta 0. Just check to make sure you're paying attention. Divided by beta 1. Okay. Now if I know what y is, then I would just simply put y in there. Okay. Now what will be then the estimate of x? I'll just put hats there, right? And that will be my estimate of x. So now, given that as background, what would you do to get the confidence interval for the true value of x? guys are making this difficult, more difficult than it should be. Just put in some code in there that calculates x hat. Now you also return an x hat. Use the boot.ci function, you're done. That's it. <coughs> so again, all this is is just a direct extension of the stuff that we've done before. Now that we've laid the groundwork with the previous set of bootstrap notes. And that's why I don't go into in detail here, and rather I think it's just best for me to uh, talk about it here. But you know, you should make sure on your own after class that you can in fact do the programming and you can get it done. Okay, so we talked about model-based resampling. Next we're going to talk about case-based resampling. I must admit that this is easier to do. Because that, in fact, you've actually even done this before. Remember with the CD4 data set uh, for, I think it was assignment, num assignment number one? Um, no, assignment number two. Uh, what you did was you simply resampled rows of your data frame. In other words, you were resampling cases. That's all you do here. So let's say if I just had simple linear regression that I was concerned about again, so I have X and Y pairs, then all I would do you just sample these pairs with replacement. That's case-based resampling. Quite easy. Now, if you had more than one explanatory variables, well, you basically do the same thing. You take your y and then your, uh, let's say, your vector of your x's for every single observation, you resample them together. Okay. <clears throat> So let's, well, what, which one's better to use, case-based resampling or model-based resampling? Well, when you're resampling cases, you make no assumption about that constant variance. Now remember, when we were doing model-based resampling, we basically had assumed that our general form of our model held, that we had this sigma square that was the same for every single observation. That's why went, we went through the trouble of finding, for example, the modified residuals and stuff like that. With case resam resampling, you don't make that kind of assumption. In fact, you're not even making an assumption about a particular model form, uh, at least in terms of the resampling process itself, where you were with, mo with model-based resampling. The one kind of problem then with case-based resampling is that this causes different designs to occur. Because there may be some resamples where you don't have the first observation appearing in your resample anymore or you might not have the nth observation. So you have different designs. And in your very first stack course, when you're talking about simple linear regression, one of the big warnings that hopefully your instructor gave you was that you don't, let's say, extrapolate, extrapolate uh, your predictions beyond the range of your x's. So you can see here, depending upon what your interests are for, uh, uh, for, for your inferences, uh, this is a possibility that you might have some resamples in your data, s in, in, in uh, some resamples that you obtain that don't have the X's that you're, um, that you need. Um, now, obviously, if you have a very large data, s if, if, as long as you don't have a small data set, this isn't going to be a big problem most of the time. 
Uh, but it is something to think about. And you know, even in Davis and Hinckley's book, you know, they say, well, the variation in these X stars, you could say, uh, you know, will cause some vari variation in the information that you have. But fortunately, it's often unimportant in moderately large data sets. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about how we can do then case-based resampling. It's not difficult at all. And in fact, you will be doing a, a form of case-based resampling for the assignment. So again, I'm going to uh, set a C, use the boot function. Notice when I'm passing in for my data, the actual data set itself. My statistic that I'm going to calculate for every resample is calc.t.cases, 4,999 resamples in ordinary uh, resampling. Here is my calc.t.cases, the usual function format, data and I. The first uh, uh, row, or I'm sorry, the first line of code in that function is when I get my resample data just like how you did with the CD4 data set. Then simply, yeah, I fit a model to my resample data. I summarize the sample data. And then I return my beta hats and my uh, square root of my MSE. So if I ran this in a, in a test situation, I get exactly the same uh, uh, estimates as I did uh, with my original data which is again was different from what we did from the um, uh, model based resample. Okay. So we can again do the same kinds of comparisons that we did before. So uh, here's my distribution, my beta hat uh, zero stars. And it looks like normality works rather well. Here's for my beta hat one stars. Normality is not too bad, but you see a little bit of deviations here and here. That's really not too bad. Okay, so then as I say here, you should think about what, did, what could be done next. How would you find a confidence interval for beta one? How would you do a confidence interval for expected value y? How would you do, for example, inverse prediction? And it's just a, it just carries forward to what we had discussed before. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, that takes us then to page 15. Now, one thing that you have to be a little bit careful about when you're doing, using the bootstrap with, um, uh, with regression models is with prediction intervals. Um, prediction intervals are not gonna, I'm not gonna test you over this because we need to move on, but I just wanna at least alert you to this so that if you end up encountering this in some of your research or in applications later, you know to be a little bit careful. So now, you know, prediction intervals um, are you know, a little bit different from what we call confidence intervals in a regression setting. Where confidence intervals in a regression setting, we're looking at the expected value of y. Here with prediction intervals, we want y itself. We want an interval for that. Um, and so let's say that we want to do this prediction at a vector of x's. We'll call it x plus. Just to emphasize the pluses there, just to emphasize that, yes, this is maybe a new observation. And we want to predict what y will be for this new observation and have a certain level of confidence with it. Now, based upon our regression model, Again, think of x plus as a vector of our x's and beta is a vector of our betas. Uh, hopefully I said that right. x plus is a vector of our x's and beta is a vector of our betas. Um, so this is how you would find then y plus. Now the big difference between this equation and then one if I had expected value of y on the left hand side is that you got this guy right here. So now we have this additional uh, variability that we have to account for. And that's why, for example, prediction intervals are always going to be wider than confidence intervals. Prediction intervals for y are always wider than confidence intervals for expected value of y. You, know, you can see that if you look at the equation for it in a simple linear regression setting by looking at the variance. And so because of that, then, we have to make sure that our bootstrap incorporates this additional level of variability. 
So not only will you do the resampling like what we just got done talking about before, you also need to do a little bit of extra resampling for the epsilon plus to get this extra variability in there. Um, I've laid out some stuff here. You can take a look at it on your own. Uh, again, I'm not going to test you over it. I just wanted to bring this to your attention. Unfortunately, we just can't do everything. Okay. Well, what about hypothesis testing for regression parameters? You know, let's say that we have a simple linear regression model once again. And we have beta 1 is equal to 0 versus beta 1 does not equal 0. Again, we need to resample under the null hypothesis here. So what do we do for case-based resampling? This is going to be very similar to what you're going to need to do for the assignment. Well, if in this particular case, again, assume that we have simple linear regression. We got one explanatory variable, we got one response. So what we're saying is essentially, you know, what, what happens with x has no effect on y. So in other words, think about it now in terms of our data, you know, how these x's came about are totally separate from how the y's came about. So to resample under the null hypothesis, what we could do is resample from the y's independently of resampling from the x's. Put them back together, and now you have a data set formed under the null hypothesis. Just like what we did with the Larry Bird data. Although it was for a different problem. It's the same exact concept. So that's how you do case-based resampling. Now, if you didn't, um, you know, let's say that you had a, a, a regression model that looked like this. So now you have two explanatory variables, and you wanted to test in your null hypothesis beta 1, sorry, that's so messy, beta 1 is equal to beta 2 is equal to 0, versus at least 1 is not equal to 0. How would you do the resampling in that case? for case-based. Hopefully I don't have that up there. Good. We're resampling cases. So, resample independently from your y's. Now for your x's, you have two x's that you have to worry about. So essentially you resample the rows. Resample from the rows for the x's part, x part of the data frame. Because again, we're resampling cases. And so we're looking at an overall measurement of are any of the x's important or not. Now what becomes a lot more complicated is let's say I still have this exact same model here, but now I only want to test maybe beta 2. Then things become more complicated. Um, and I kind of talk about how to do that uh, in the notes. Take a look at my full set of not set 950 notes if you want to see um, better examples than what I have here. Okay. Now if I want to do model based resampling then, and if I want to test again back to that simple linear regression setting, let's say I want to test is beta 1 equal to 0 or not. Well what, what's our model under HO? Well, beta 1 is equal to 0. So this is what I'm saying my model is under the null hypothesis. And so what I need to do now is basically find my residuals, and then also our modified residuals, and then also the mean adjusted modified residuals by fitting a model, uh, by fitting this model to my observed data. Resample from those mean adjusted modified residuals, and then put them back into your model to get your Y stars. Once you got your Y stars, now fit your full model that has X in it. Because again, what you need to do is you're trying to estimate the sampling distribution of beta hat 1 under the null hypothesis. So that's why you have to go back to your original data or your original model itself. Okay. I am not going to ask you questions on a test about how to do hypothesis testing with respect to the bootstrap and, and regression models. However, on the project, you do have one for a generalized linear model. So let's just briefly talk about that. Oh, 
Okay, so if you remember with this data, be my ruler. So we basically have two treatments, beer or water, and we're looking at these binomial counts as our response, the number of mosquitoes that are attracted to an individual. So the first observation, 27 mosquitoes were attracted to the first individual, 27 out of 100. And so what I ask you to do then in part, yeah, part E is to estimate a logistic regression model using the GLM function, response as the response variable, treatment as the explanatory variable. Are there any questions about how to fit that model? Okay. Um, I ask you also to perform the regular old uh, Likert ratio tests as well with a, and then use a standard chi-square approximation with it. Now we get to the bootstrap part. So let's perform a bootstrap test using case-based resampling. So again, you're going to have to resample under the null hypothesis, just like what we talked about. So your x's here are treatment, your y here is the response. So you need to resample from those, um, uh, essentially you could say the vectors of data independently, put them back together into a data frame, and there's a data set formed under the null hypothesis. Fit a full model then to that data set. Then for every single resampled data set, you fit the model, you get a negative 2 log lambda statistic, so you're, so you're going to have a whole bunch of negative 2 log <coughs> lambda stars, you could say. Um, I set a seat so I can reproduce your result there um, and perform the test. So, likelihood ratio test, is this going to be a left tail or let's say left sided? right-sided or two-sided test. No, not two-sided. Right-sided. Right-sided, right yeah. Because remember, only large values indicate evidence against the null hypothesis. So what you're doing then with this p-value that you're calculating with the bootstrap is you're looking at how extreme is your observed negative 2 log lambda that you got relative to this distribution that you have essentially simulated under the null hypothesis. And then part three then will give you a nice little visualization of this distribution. So construct a histogram of all these negative two log lambda stars. Um, plot the, the observed negative two log lambda and put the appropriate chi-square one distribution on it. And tell me, what do you think? Do you think uh, chi-square one approximation is justifiable based upon what the bootstrap said? So again, this is another example of where you're using the bootstrap essentially to verify that indeed this large sample approximation that you would normally use with a negative two log lambda, will it work? For the Kalsman p-function, uh, if we use uh, LM or GLM, you do not want us to actually do the negative two log lambda. Well, I think your calc dot t <coughs> function, the, probably the only thing that it needs to return is a negative two log lambda. Right. And you can extract that from the model with it. Yep. Yeah, so, for example, one way to do the negative two log lambda part, if you're not familiar, is to use that in a NOVA function in R. Mm -hmm. I think I use the, what I call in set 875, the capital ANOVA function from the car package. So there's a variety of different functions that will calculate negative two log lambda. Are there any questions? Okay, let's move on and finish up these notes. So uh, that takes us to page 22. Okay, so some final comments. You know, overall, you know, with the bootstrap, you know, as I've said before, you know, I would spend a 15-week semester to talk about the bootstrap. Um, and so there's stuff here that I think it's, it's, it's important, but, you know, you just can't fit it in. So I'm going to briefly talk about some things here. Um, you know, my goal, the first time around with teaching a computational statistics course that has the bootstrap in it, my goal was to do four weeks or less on the bootstrap. Um, and we got a little bit over four weeks. So 
you know, I think anybody who's going to teach a computational statistics class, they might emphasize one subject over another based upon their background. And, um, you know, I probably emphasize the bootstrap more than what most people would, but I think the bootstrap is very important and it can be extremely useful. Um, and so that's why I do it. Okay, so we've spent all our time basically talking about the non-parametric bootstrap. We've only talked about a little bit about the parametric bootstrap. And that's because the parametric bootstrap is relatively simple. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, we've been saying, well, we're just simply using the plug-in principle. You know, we're using f hat, our edf, and we plug it, plug it in for f everywhere uh, with the non-parametric bootstrap. Now, f hat with the parametric bootstrap essentially is a parametric distribution. So, for example, with the AC data, if I ha make the assumption that the data is coming from an exponential mu, and remember we looked at some plots, excuse me, at, at, at the beginning of, of the bootstrap section that said, yeah, you know, exponential might work out okay. Well, now with the parametric bootstrap, f hat is exponential y bar. So instead of now taking physics, actually, maybe that's not the best way to put it, instead of physically taking resamples from your y's, now you are just simply taking your resamples by simulating data from an exponential y bar. That's it. The boot function can be the boot function can be used for it. I must admit that it's a little it can be a little bit awkward to use the boot function with parametric bootstrap. Um, there is, if you remember that sim argument in the boot function, you have to change that to I think it's parametric. Sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, and you have to restructure your calc.t a little bit because now you no longer have indices that you're passing in. And you also have to tell R, well, what is the parametric distribution itself? So uh, if you want to see some examples of how to do the parametric bootstrap in R, take a look at my chapter two notes uh, uh, for set 950. Uh, as I said, it can be a little awkward using the boot function, so it's oftentimes it's just easier just to program it without the boot function. Um, now, one of the interesting things then is that since we actually have f hat being a, um, an actual parametric distribution in the end, well, you can come up, you don't even have to take resampling often. You can often come up with closed form expressions for what bootstrap confidence intervals will be, for example. So, in this particular case, when we're, work, when we're wanting to estimate mu, you know, get a confidence interval for mu, let's say, then instead of taking samples from exponential y bar, what one could do is, well, derive the distribution for the sample mean of the y's. Well, using your background Cassell and Berger, you should be able to do that. It's a gamma distribution, first parameter is n, and the scale parameter is mu divided by n. So then the distribution for t star itself is gamma n comma y bar divided by n. So what's the percentile interval? Well, just take the, let's say maybe the 0 0.025 quantile from this gamma, take the 0.975 quantile from that gamma, there you go. There's your bootstrap confidence interval. Very simple. Now you might be thinking, well, you know, there's probably no use for the parametric bootstrap. Maybe it's just more for, uh, <laughs> You know, in a classroom setting to demonstrate what the what um, uh, what what you what how how to do the bootstrap. Well, that's not necessarily true. While it can be very useful in a classroom setting, uh, where I have used it before is that remember, for example, uh, you're often doing uh, uh, stuff with asymptotic distributions. You know, for example, with a Likert ratio test, negative two long negative two log lambda has a um, uh, large, uh, had, uh, negative two log lambda converges in distribution to a chi-squared distribution, okay? Well, if you're concerned if your sample size is high enough to get that chi-squared distribution to work, rather than doing a non-parametric bootstrap, do a parametric. And, you know, simulate your data based upon various assumptions that you're having to make in a parametric setting calculate negative two log lambda star every single time, and there you go. So you should think about, and I'm not gonna test you on this, but you should think about how you could do a parametric bootstrap hypothesis, uh, hypothesis test for that last problem on, on the assignment. Again, I'm not gonna uh, test you over it, but you should think about how to do it. 
Okay, cautious about the bootstrap. Now, the, the bootstrap is not perfect. When does the bootstrap have problems? Well, here's the main reason, or this main situation went well. Small changes in F, so your CDF of your original data, causes large changes in G. And we think of G as maybe the distribution of T, or statistical matrix. If that happens, you could have big problems with the bootstrap. Well, why? And it, it all comes down to this plug-in principle then. You know, if you're plugging in F hat into your statistical function, and due to small changes of F hat, your statistic itself changes a lot, Think about how that's going to affect now the bootstrap. Because everything relies on that F hat, essentially. Well, where is a case where this occurs? Order statistics. So let's say for some reason you wanted to estimate the nth order statistic. Don't use a bootstrap for that. Because think about what will happen to that. There are particular small changes that can happen to F that could really change what that largest order statistic is. And because of that, it, you can have some big problems. Um, there's a nice example in my chapter two lecture notes uh, where I basically illustrate kind of a special case of what Davidson Hinckley talks about for an order statistic example. So what we want to work with in, in terms of the bootstrap is smooth statistical functions. What that basically means is that small changes in F cause cause small changes in your statistics. Or your parameter too. Um, here's another place where problems can occur with the bootstrap. Now remember how we've been talking about taking resamples. Basically, we're taking a random sample from F hat. Well, let's say that your data itself has some underlying dependence. Like maybe, for example, in a time series situation where you have the value of y at y at time n is dependent upon the value of y at time n minus 1. Well, you in that particular case, you cannot just simply take resamples like we've been talking about before. And so you have to take resamples in a different way that account for the dependence that is in your random variables. Um, and so there are a variety of different ways that um, where this can be done ways to do this. So for example, with the time series data, you might uh, resample blocks of your data. So maybe uh, uh, take blocks of size 10 of your y's and resample those rather than resampling one y at a time. That's called a block bootstrap. And then lastly, so much of the underlying mathematical development of the bootstrap relies on things called Edgeworth expansions. And this all gets into then using asymptotics to show that indeed the bootstrap works. You know, we, I, I, I introduced some of those kinds of concepts to you earlier in terms of talking about f hat in the um, Monte Carlo simulation section, how f hat is a good estimate of f. And we talked about various reasons why. Uh, but <coughs> um, a lot of the theory that um, that the bootstrap is built on to show that it works relies on these things called Edgeworth expansions. And you often will, will learn about those Edgeworth expansions in like a advanced probability, a um, asymptotics course, but not, not necessarily always. And what Edgeworth expansions are, are basically, let's say, Taylor series expansions of a statistic, like, like a Taylor series expansion statistic. The, the, the big difference is that here, what we're doing is instead of working with a statistic, we're working with probability distributions. And you approximate then this probability distribution in terms of expansions with respect to a normal distribution. Um, that's what this is built on. And uh, Peter Hall's chapter two of his book basically introduces these expansions and then a lot of his other stuff in his book then relies on these expansions, expansions to show that the bootstrap works as and goes to infinity. Okay. So, that concludes the bootstrap. Are there any questions? 
Okay, so then that takes us then to our next topic, finally. Pull some stuff out here. So next we're going to talk about parallel processing. Let's uh, just do a brief introduction here since we have time. Let me just close this. Got lots of files open here. Ah, and for some reason I did not open. I thought I had my notes open. Okay, let's see here. Wrong class. So, we are going to talk about parallel processing in the context of what are called embarrassingly parallel sets. The one that we will focus on the most is Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, so with respect to a Monte Carlo simulation, you know, let's say what happens for, so let's say that you, you take, um, you form capital R different simulated data sets. So you're doing capital R simulations. What happens on simulation one is not going to have an effect on what happens on simulation two. It's not going to have an effect on simulation three or four and so on. You know, your calculations are not going to change. These are essentially independent data sets that you're getting for every single Monte Carlo simulation. So what we've been doing so far is that when we do those Monte Carlo simulations, we use simply one, I'm going to call it, um, let's go ahead and see. one processor, we'll call it that for now, one processor on one computer, and we do these in order. So we do simulation, uh, we do the simulation one, we do simulation two, we do simulation three, and we do that all in order. But since simulation three has no effect on simulation one, you know, a way to speed up these computations is that maybe what we could do is send simulation one to another computer, send simulation three to another computer, send simulation two to another computer, and so on, and actually distribute them. And then in the end, once those simulations are done, you bring them all back together, and you summarize what has just happened. That's what I mean by parallel processing. Things are happening in parallel, but they're happening on, let's say, different computers. The advantage of that is that you can have great speed reductions, or or time reductions, I should say, for how long your, your things are going to take, your Monte Carlo simulation will take. So instead of using one computer, we could use as many as we want, or many, as many as we have access to. So uh, let me actually show you a diagram here. So this is might, might be what you have. So maybe this thing that's in the, called the master, maybe that's your computer that's essentially controlling all your Monte Carlo simulations. And let's say you have 1,000 uh, Monte Carlo simulations to run and might send 250 of them to one computer, which we're going to call worker number one, 250 of them to worker number two, 250 for three, and 250 for worker number four. Once those are done, they come back to the master computer they're all organized together, and then they're summarized, just like how we've done summarization before. That again is parallel processing. Originally, this is how people did parallel processing completely, where you had maybe five computers to do this. You have workers, and you have a master, a master computer. Uh, you can even think of your master computer could be a worker itself. So now maybe have 200 simulations on each computer. Then about, I don't even have the notes up. Then about in 2006, multi-core processors started to come out. Someone tell me what a multi-core processor is without looking at my notes. Computer with multiple cores on it. Yeah, a computer with multiple cores. But what what do I mean by cores? 
<laughs> Things that can't compute. Hey, you are correct. Okay. Uh, you can almost think of it as basic computers within a computer. So you know, in your computer, this is my computer here, uh, you have a, a, a chip. Okay? Inside this chip, basically, you could have, let's say, uh, additional chips uh, that can, can control on its own uh, calculations. So, like for example, my computer here, uh, it, it's, it's a multi-core processor, and it basically has two parts to that multi-core. And one part could do, let's say, um, one part right now is actually recording this presentation. And then if I want to, let's say, use R, then the other part will simultaneously run R separately. And these two things can be occurring exactly at the same time. Your computer is not going to slow down at all. Because I have two, you could say, mini computers within my original computer itself. Using better terminology, I have two cores in my processor. Cell phone, and so this was a, and starting about 2006. All computers, all like desktop, laptop, tablets, are multi, have multi-core processors. Your cell phone, uh, if you have a smartphone, it's going to most likely have a multi-core processor on it. So I think I have a Samsung Galaxy 5. I believe it has four cores in its processor. It might be just two, but it's either two or four. And what that allows you to do, for example, when I'm, let's say, talking to someone on, my, on the phone, I can look at my phone here, and then I can maybe surf the internet at the same time as I'm talking to the person on, on my phone. And nothing's going to be slowing down because one core is controlling my phone conversation, another core is controlling you know, what I'm doing while I'm surfing the web. Okay? These are multiple core processors. Since all computers now have these multi-core processors, it makes parallel processing much easier than what it was before. Because before, you had to figure out how you could have these five computers all talk to each other, all communicate. Now, since essentially everything is inside one computer itself, the communication is a lot easier and even faster. And so what this has allowed people to do is take parallel processing to beyond, you know, let's say experts in computing. Um, just anybody you now can easily do um, uh, parallel processing because everything is embedded on one chip. Okay, so what this section right now, what we're going to talk about is parallel processing using one computer that has a multi core processor. The next section after this, we're going to talk about high performance computing. And basically what that means is now you're using um, computers that have a lot of cores in it and also maybe you could use a uh, multiple processors that have multiple cores all at the same time and that's then using the supercomputers on campus so this parallel processing sh again shows you how to do it. this parallel processing section will show you how to do it on your own computer and then the next set of notes will talk about the supercomputers and doing parallel processing on that are there any questions? Okay, that's it for today.